Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Aurelio was slowly strolling along the central street of the city. The office of the company where the man had been working as an engineer for almost 15 years had recently moved to a new building. On one hand, getting to work became more challenging as it was farther from home and he had to face morning and evening traffic jams. On the other hand, the building itself was beautiful and bright. And the cityscape around was eye-pleasing, well-dressed people, squares, fountains, and picturesque parks. It was the city center. Aurelio had recently made it a rule not to rush to the parking lot immediately after the end of the workday, but to walk for some time. It was a kind of relaxation. Every day here felt like a celebration. He saw children with balloons and ice cream and horses pulling carriages. By the time you walked back and forth, the evening traffic jams would be gone, and you could calmly get into the car and drive home. Since Simona moved in with Aurelio, coming home has become much more pleasant. Now the apartment smelled completely different, of fresh baking, delicious homemade food, women's perfumes, and creams, some cozy and pleasant scents. Simona herself was cozy, warm, and kind. Next to her, Aurelio's heart gradually softened. Many trials had fallen to his lot. Not everyone has to go through what happened to Aurelio's family. The man thought he was no longer capable of strong feelings. But Simona became a real discovery for him. It turned out that there could be joy in his life. Quiet, calm, soothing joy, so to speak, joint family TV series evenings, outings with friends for picnics, a trip to the sea in the velvety season. Nevertheless, heavy thoughts did not completely leave Aurelio. There was a sense of something unfinished and indefinite. How could it be otherwise when no one knew what happened to Anselma? Young parents with little children, especially four- or five-year-old girls, still attracted Aurelio's attention. Now, he was staring at the family that was walking just ahead of him. A young, slender mom, the family's father with a bright t-shirt print and denim shorts, and two children, an eight-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl. The boy was walking with an indifferent and bored look. Perhaps he didn't want to go for a walk with the family. But the girl was looking around with curious eyes and asking questions. Aurelio clearly saw that the parents were a bit tired of the communicativeness of their younger daughter. The mother answered briefly, and the father even asked the child to be quiet. Oh, youth. They don't understand the happiness of walking with a little daughter and talking to her hand in hand, Aurelio thought. He would gladly answer a million questions from a four-year-old girl right now. They say we don't appreciate and are lost, weeping. Although, why not appreciate it? Many years ago, Aurelio consciously enjoyed fatherhood. Anselma, his daughter, never irritated him like this young father. And she didn't tire of the mother, walking with an unhappy face slightly away from him. Perhaps it was because he and Teresa had waited for this child for so long. Aurelio and Teresa met back in college, studying adjacent engineering specialties. Many lectures were common for them. Aurelio immediately noticed the cute, quiet student with big blue eyes. It wasn't surprising, there were few girls in their faculty. Yet Teresa was among them. Light wavy hair, wide open eyes, and regular facial features. But Aurelio was attracted not only by her lovely appearance. Unlike other girls, Teresa did not flirt with guys. She was genuinely passionate about the subject, just like Aurelio himself. And she bluntly rejected young men trying to start a relationship with her. Aurelio once arranged it so that he had to study with Teresa, they had to work together on a project. That work brought them closer. They formed a very well-coordinated team. Thus began a friendship that later grew into something more. Teresa and Aurelio had a lot in common. They grew up in roughly similar families, shared the same interests, and even their life plans were largely aligned. Both wanted to build their careers first, achieve something, find their place, and then consider starting a family. The young couple got married and rented an apartment. Teresa found a position in a laboratory and continued her scientific work, while Aurelio opted for an internship and joined the engineering department at the factory. Initially, both earned literal pennies. 
Later, the spouses climbed the career ladder, and their incomes increased. Soon, they were able to buy their own apartment and renovate it. The newlyweds lived soulfully together. It was so easy and pleasant for Aurelio to be with Teresa, she understood him with half a word. And he, in turn, understood her just as well. There were no loud arguments or quarrels between them. All issues were resolved through negotiation and discussion of facts and opinions. Aurelio's mother often told him that no girl would get along with him, which was meticulous and correct. She was wrong. Teresa was just as rational and conscientious as he was. It turned out they found each other. Aurelio was happy. Everything in his life was falling into place even more successfully than he could have dreamed. He had an interesting, well-paying job, a beloved, understanding wife by his side, and she was also a beauty. The spouses tried to take vacation days together. They loved traveling around the country. They went to the mountains, explored forests, and admired lakes. It was wonderful to discover all this splendor together with such an enthusiastic and admiring wife. Seven years had passed since their wedding when Aurelio and Teresa started talking about having children. They prepared the material foundation for future heirs. Grandmothers on both sides had long been waiting for grandchildren and solemnly promised to take care of the little ones, with immense pleasure, of course. Accordingly, Teresa wouldn't have to sacrifice her career. The spouses themselves were eager to have children. Aurelio imagined showing a son or daughter to the world and telling this little human about everything, and Teresa would be a wonderful mother. She was so attentive, sensitive, and wise. The spouses consciously approached the question of childbearing. First, they underwent a thorough examination to reduce the chances of having an unhealthy child. It was at this point that they found out about Teresa's serious female health issues. Pregnancy is practically impossible, declared Dr. Alejandro, the professor with whom Teresa had struggled to get an appointment. Is there really no chance at all? Aurelio clarified on that day, accompanying his wife to the clinic. Well, you can try different treatment options, the doctor responded evasively. However, all these methods are expensive and time-consuming, and I can't guarantee any results. It's a congenital developmental anomaly. Unfortunately, it happens. This was a blow for the couple. Everything had been going according to plan for them until now, and then suddenly this after Professor Alejandro voiced the bleak verdict, both Aurelio and Teresa suddenly realized how much they wanted to become parents. The period of treatment began, involving visits to various doctors, endless tests, and periodic hospitalizations for Teresa. All of this consumed a lot of money, time, and, most importantly, emotional strength. It was challenging to first hope, follow all the doctor's prescriptions, and then be disappointed repeatedly. Always calm and rational, Teresa now often cried when she thought her husband wasn't around. But he noticed everything, her reddened eyes and swollen eyelids. And, most importantly, the desperate look full of pain. It was hard for Aurelio to see his wife like this. His main desire now was not a child, but the peace and happiness of the woman he loved. But how to help Teresa? Aurelio didn't know the answer to that question. As best as he could, he supported his wife, arranged consultations in the country's best reproductive centers for her, accompanied her to painful procedures, and comforted her. Maybe we should give up on this idea? He sometimes suggested. The pursuit of a child had taken on an unhealthy character, and Aurelio wanted to put an end to it. Let's focus on our career development. That's important, too. Once, work, scientific activity, that was the main focus of Teresa's life. Her eyes sparkled when she was talking about another development or experimental project. Work inspired Teresa and gave her strength and energy. And she was excellent at her job, very good. People respected her, invited her for consultations, and approached her with complex questions. Aurelio was happy for his wife and proud of her, he understood Teresa. He himself dedicated a lot of time and effort to the factory and also considered himself a first-class specialist. However, the spouses worked in slightly different areas. Teresa had changed a lot. 
She no longer took on interesting projects, spent time in the laboratory only from one call to the next, and hurried home. The once outstanding scientist now preferred simple routine work and has completely abandoned her research. This truly frightened Aurelio. He understood, of course, that the female body is different from the male one. Representatives of the fairer sex are more susceptible to hormonal influence, maternal instinct is a great force, and all that. But still, he couldn't ignore the changes happening to Teresa. She became weepy, irritable, and even somewhat capricious. The most unpleasant part was that she became fixated on this elusive motherhood. She turned having a child into an obsessive idea, and nothing else interested her. Nothing pleased or excited her. She even stopped communicating with her colleagues and spent all her free time studying information about her diagnosis. Several long years passed. During this period, Teresa would calm down for a while and return to work, but the dream of becoming a mother never left her completely, and sooner or later, everything resumed, visits to doctors, tests, and examinations. Medicine is not standing still, new reproductive technologies are emerging, and old ones are being perfected, we need to try, Teresa explained her behavior to her husband, Aurelio. Aurelio missed the old Teresa, smart, determined, and understanding. Sometimes she would briefly return, and it was real happiness. They would talk about various topics again, watch movies together, and plan trips. Maybe we should adopt a child from an orphanage? Aurelio brought up this suggestion to his wife repeatedly. He believed that a child, even if not biologically theirs, would make Teresa happy, finally allowing her to feel like a mother. But Teresa only wanted her own child. She pursued her goal, oblivious to everything and everyone around her. After approximately 15 years of marriage, the long-awaited pregnancy finally happened, aided by the experimental method. Aurelio and Teresa were almost 40 by then. Aurelio hadn't expected such a result, and the news took him by surprise. It even scared him and threw him off balance a little. After so many years of living only with his wife, suddenly. But Teresa was unconditionally happy. Despite severe nausea that prevented her from eating in the first few months, constant abdominal and lower back pain, and dizziness, Teresa had a difficult time with the pregnancy. She hardly left the hospital, constantly lying under various strips, taking handfuls of medications, and enduring painful injections. There were several threats of a miscarriage, but doctors managed to maintain the complicated pregnancy as Teresa was under special control. To be honest, Aurelio didn't have any warm feelings for the future child. He perceived it as a problem, an obstacle preventing his wife from living a normal, fulfilling life. And then Anselma was born, and Aurelio was the first to hold this tiny, wrinkled creature in his arms. Teresa insisted that her husband be present during the birth. It's such an event. Long awaited and grandiose. She said, so many problems and trials behind us. And here it is, a prize. Besides, the doctors say we won't have any more children, for sure. So, Aurelio had no desire to be in the delivery room. He was frightened by the process itself and felt no reverence for the whole process, but he had to be there. The moment Aurelio first looked at his newborn daughter's face, he suddenly felt that the world had turned upside down for him, becoming completely different. The baby was crying loudly, overwhelmed by all the drastic changes she had experienced. And Aurelio understood that his little girl was cold, scared, and in pain. He felt it with some internal instinct. Aurelio held his daughter close, gently rocking her in his arms. The baby whimpered a few more times, looked at him, and calmed down. She felt safe with her father. Aurelio realized that his daughter was now the closest and dearest person to him. He would move mountains and fetch the moon for her. Then they took the baby back to the mother. She needed to be fed, and Aurelio was asked to leave the room. You'll meet each other at the discharge, the midwife smiled. Right now, the mother and the baby need some time alone. Aurelio and Teresa were wonderful parents. They could spend hours just admiring their little Anselma. Everything about her amused and entertained them, her attempts to reach for toys, the way she wiggled her little arms and legs, and her cooing. 
the first smile, the first tooth, the first unsteady steps, all of these became grand events for the new parents. Every morning, Aurelio had to leave for work, leaving Anselma in Teresa's care. Teresa had fully immersed herself in motherhood, something she had been longing for. Teresa did a lot for Anselma, massaging her, preparing delicious baby meals, and taking her for walks. With her characteristic enthusiasm, Teresa studied literature on the development of young children and applied her newfound knowledge to her own child. Thanks to this, Anselma acquired new skills faster than her peers. She started speaking early and learned to draw, mold, and button her clothes. Aurelio and Teresa couldn't be happier with their little daughter. She was so smart and such a beauty. Anselma externally resembled Aurelio's mother, thick dark hair, huge brown eyes, and tanned skin. She doesn't look like me at all. The fair-skinned, red-haired Teresa marveled. Nothing surprising. They say dark genes are stronger. Aurelio joked. Well, that's good. But what a bright girl is growing up. Black eyebrows, long dark eyelashes, she won't even need makeup. She won't have to spend a fortune on cosmetics. Anselma grew up as an affectionate and obedient girl, yet she was very curious. She inherited a passion for exploration from both parents. Teresa was very concerned about this aspect of her daughter. Anselma climbed everywhere. She was interested in what was on the top shelves of the closet, how the alarm clock worked, and how deep a puddle was. She climbed trees to get a better look at fruits or flowers and sat over open hatches, peering into the darkness. She might fall somewhere and get hurt, Teresa lamented. I have to keep an eye on this little troublemaker. Yes, Aurelio agreed. We've got a lively girl. He was proud that his daughter was so curious. Teresa was proud too, but sometimes she got very tired of keeping a constant watch over the active child. However, she never complained about their fate. All the troubles associated with their daughter brought her great joy. Aurelio sometimes felt that his wife was overly protective of their only child. Perhaps it would be easier to handle certain things, giving the girl more independence, which she sought. But Aurelio tried not to interfere in Anselma's upbringing. First, his wife, who had read lots of books about children, knew better. Second, Teresa had long dreamed of motherhood, and she was already of a mature age for a mother. In their situation, it was easy to overlook certain things. Anselma adored her parents. She always looked forward to her father's return from work, eager to climb onto his lap and ask him millions of questions. She loved to play lively and noisy games, like pillow fights and tag, which Teresa couldn't manage. After work, Aurelio enjoyed taking walks in the park with his daughter. Sometimes Teresa joined them, but more often she stayed home to tidy up in peace, prepare a delicious dinner, and take a break from the energetic child. Initially, father and daughter strolled along the paths, engaging in serious conversations. They speculated about where flies and beetles hibernate, fantasized about the lives of mysterious pond creatures, and discussed the cartoons on Selma had watched during the day. Aurelio smiled, observing his serious and thoughtful daughter. He believed she had a bright future ahead of her. Later, Aurelio would lead Anselma to the playground, and the fun would begin. Anselma climbed slides and bars freely, something she didn't allow herself to do when her mother was around, as Teresa was too concerned about her precious treasure. Anselma always made friends with the other kids immediately, as they loved her for being a cheerful, funny, and sociable girl. Aurelio was pleased that his child easily connected with her peers. The attentive father was sure his daughter would enjoy kindergarten, but Teresa resisted the idea. She had deliberately left her job to take care of the girl herself. I didn't give birth to her just to pass her off to the state later, she said. No, I intend to fully enjoy motherhood. And what about kindergarten? It's just a babysitting service for working parents. I spend a lot of time with our daughter, developing her. No, let her be with me, it's better that way. Aurelio didn't argue, but from time to time, he brought up the idea of daycare again. After all, there were children, songs, and dances. Teresa prepared her daughter for a scientific career, believing she should follow in her footsteps. 
and it seemed to work for Anselma. She absorbed everything quickly, her brain worked efficiently, but Aurelio noticed other talents in his daughter. Anselma had an amazing voice, clear, ringing, and high-pitched. When the little one sang songs from cartoons, Aurelio couldn't help but be captivated. He himself had attended a music school long ago. Although he hadn't achieved much success in that field, the knowledge he gained was enough to understand that Anselma had a remarkable ear. She reproduced melodies very accurately. It was a miracle, another little miracle from Anselma. Maybe we should take her to an audition with a music teacher? Aurelio suggested it to his wife. Anselma clearly has talent. She's still so little. Teresa dismissed. They take kids into music school when they are six or seven years old. Besides, our daughter doesn't need that. She'll become a great scientist, mark my words. Teresa, having become a mother, felt happy, but she never returned to her former self. She remained very anxious, overly focused on the child. Nevertheless, this was better than the state she was in while struggling to achieve the desired pregnancy. Aurelio still loved her, perhaps even more than in their youth. They had become a real family, raising a wonderful child. It was such happiness. Aurelio tried to overlook minor issues, such as Teresa's fixation on their child and her excessive worry about their daughter. He understood why his wife behaved that way. The man often indulged his daughter. Coming home from work, he would buy her gifts for no reason, sweets, dolls, plush animals. It was pure joy to see Anselma's eyes light up with happiness when she saw her father pulling out of a bag a surprise for her. And when the little girl wrapped her arms around his neck and whispered, Thank you, Daddy, Aurelio's heart melted with tenderness. The man had never imagined that one could experience such strong emotions. Teresa always tried to make her daughter's birthdays bright and beautiful. She prepared for the grand celebration in advance, planning the theme, choosing gifts, and either buying or making decorations. Anselma's second birthday was themed around Disney princesses as she adored those cartoons. At her third birthday, they had a ball in the underwater palace of the king, inspired by Anselma's fascination with the Little Mermaid. The girl's fourth birthday transformed their home into the land of unicorns. Teresa had accomplished the almost impossible. In just an hour, she turned the apartment into a magical place, the abode of these fantastic creatures. Anselma loved unicorns at the time, watching cartoons about them, drawing them, and molding fairy tale characters out of clay. Oh, how I'd love to ride on one. She would dreamily say, Teresa would just smile and shrug. Sweetie, understand that unicorns live so far away. They don't wander into our parts. I understand, and it's really, really sad. Aurelio decided that for his daughter's birthday, he would fulfill her cherished dream at all costs. He went to the racetrack, spoke to pony instructors, and came up with a wonderful idea. One of the female instructors embraced Aurelio's plan with enthusiasm. Together, they devised a masquerade costume for a beautiful white pony that was meant to portray a unicorn. A coiled plastic horn with Velcro, pink ribbons for the mane and tail, aqua makeup to draw hearts on the animal's sides, and a wreath of artificial flowers, all of this was meant to transform the little horse into a fairy tale character. Aurelio anticipated how thrilled his daughter would be, even though this pleasure cost quite a bit of money. But what wouldn't a loving father do for his little princess? When the main surprise was ready, Aurelio started thinking about the gift. It had to be something thematic and very beautiful. Through acquaintances abroad, the man ordered a plush unicorn. Nowadays, children's stores abound with various toys, but back then, finding such an original character was almost impossible. However, the loving father didn't stop there. Anselma was already four years old. She knew a lot and understood much. It was time to give her something beautiful, elegant, and distinctly feminine. Aurelio ordered a wonderful silver set from a jewelry workshop, a bracelet, and earrings. Most importantly, the jewelry was shaped like tiny unicorns covered in pink enamel. Finding a jeweler willing to take on such a challenging task took Aurelio a long time. The work was intricate, and professionals were hesitant to get involved. 
In the end, an elderly jeweler finally agreed. He worked tirelessly, constantly tweaking and refining. But in the end, the result was so beautiful that Aurelio couldn't help but let out an admiring sigh when he first saw the set. Teresa was also thrilled. Oh my God, what a miracle. The woman nodded her head. I've never seen anything like it. You're amazing. There's nothing else like it in the world. Assured Aurelio, enjoying his wife's reaction. It's an exclusive just for our Aunt Selma. Look, on the back of the bracelet, her name is engraved in calligraphic handwriting. How charming and refined. A gift fit for a true lady. On Selma's fourth birthday, it went wonderfully. It was a perfect celebration. The girl woke up in an apartment adorned with balloons, bright pictures, and cardboard decorations from the world of unicorns. Next to her bed was a chair piled with gifts from her parents. There were toys, fancy dresses, and colorful books, but among all the gifts, the jewelry with unicorns impressed the little girl the most. She asked to put the bracelet on her wrist, and she hadn't taken it off since. Aurelio watched his happy daughter and smiled. Later, the three of them prepared for the arrival of guests by tidying up, making salads in the kitchen, baking a delicious cake, and then decorating it with fonded figures. Anselma put in a lot of effort. In the evening, the guests arrived, and it immediately became noisy and lively in the apartment. Grandparents, friends of Teresa and Aurelio, and their children all came to celebrate. The birthday girl was bathed in gifts and compliments. But she not only accepted congratulations, the girl herself wanted to surprise the guests. In her princess dress, Anselmo was standing on a chair and singing a song from her favorite unicorn cartoon. Aurelio was listening to his daughter's clear and melodious voice, and his heart squeezed with tenderness and joy. Fate had rewarded them with a beautiful, talented daughter. In that moment, Aurelio once again thought about doing everything for Anselmo's happiness. The guests applauded loudly, calling the singer for an encore several times. Anselma didn't refuse. She liked being in the spotlight, enjoyed singing, and received compliments. Uninhibited, bold, and artistic. Aurelio decided then, despite his wife's plans, that their daughter would shine on the stage. Teresa would understand later. And then came the time for the main surprise. Children and adults poured out onto the street, gathering on the porch of the building. From the side of the arch, a real unicorn approached them. Anselma even squealed with delight. Other children followed her example. Next to the unicorn was a young fairy. The instructor made an effort. She let her light curls fall over her shoulders and wore a light, long sundress with floral patterns. May I? Can I approach him? Anselma asked the fairy, hardly believing her luck. She was almost in tears of joy. Her biggest dream had come true. Of course, you can. He'll be happy to give you a ride. Anselmo made two honorary laps around the courtyard, then hopped off the unicorn, patted him on the nose, and asked, Can it give rides to my guests too? Well, of course. He came specifically to make your party perfect. Little guests took turns riding the unicorn pony, joyfully glowing as they circled the courtyard. Anselmo's celebration became unforgettable for them too. Aurelio watched his little girl and thought that she was not only smart and beautiful, but also very kind and sensitive. Look at how she cared for others at just four years old. She asked the fairies to let her and her little guests ride the unicorn. What four-year-old child would come up with such a thing? It was a magical day. Everyone involved left with many vivid memories and equally vibrant photographs. In one picture, Anselmo was captured hugging the new plush unicorn, with a silver bracelet sparkling on her wrist and a delicate diadem adorning her head. The girl smiled widely at the camera. She was genuinely happy in that moment. This particular photograph was handed over to the investigators by Teresa just three months later. It happened on a warm September evening. Indian summer was in full swing, the most wonderful time of autumn. Golden trees, illuminated by the gentle sun, have rustling leaves underfoot. On that evening, Teresa and Anselma decided not to stay at home. Taking advantage of the wonderful weather, 
they went for a walk in the park. After all, there were festive events in the city to celebrate its day. The wife invited Aurelio, and it would have been great to stroll through the park as a family of three. Still, the man refused. He had a lot of work from the factory to finish at home. A serious inspection was coming from the capital, and he needed to complete several reports. Unfortunately, I won't be able to accompany my two beautiful ladies, Aurelio shook his head. Although I really want to. Oh, Dad. Anselma pouted. She was charming in her light red dress and a matching beret, playfully tilted to the side. Two tight braids adorned with silk pink ribbons lay on her shoulders, and new shiny little boots adorned her feet. Not the most modern look, but how original and charming. Teresa tried to dress her daughter like a doll, searching for stylish and unusual pieces. Anselma almost always stood out among the other children. Sweetheart, but I need to work, Aurelio shrugged. But don't worry, this weekend I'll go with you to the pond, I promise. To the pond? Anselma rejoiced. That's great. We'll ride the Ferris wheel and feed the ducks with bread, right? Yes, Aurelio smiled. And then we'll go to the cafe to eat your favorite pancakes with berries. Agreed? Agreed. And now have fun there without me. Later, you'll tell me everything before bedtime. And listen to mom, okay? Okay. Anselma reached out to hug her father. The sleeves of her red coat were slightly pulled up, exposing the wrist where the silver unicorn bracelet was gleaming. The girl never parted with her favorite accessory. One of the earrings, however, had already managed to get lost. The clasp turned out to be unreliable. The second, now almost useless earring, was lying in Anselma's drawer in a box. Okay, we're going to the park, Teresa smiled at her husband. Aurelio hugged his wife, kissed his daughter, escorted them to the elevator, and waved as the doors closed. This scene was still before his eyes. A dressed up, happy Anselma, smiling at her father. At that moment, Aurelio had no idea that he would never see his little girl again. There wasn't even a hint of a premonition. Aurelio returned to the apartment, sat down at the computer, and immersed himself in numbers. He needed to take advantage of the moment while it was quiet and calm in the house. In a couple of hours, Anselma would return, and she would undoubtedly want to share her impressions with her father and tell him about the walk. And then he would have to set aside all the work and listen carefully to his daughter. Aurelio knew that this contact with parents was very important for children. But he heard the sound of the key turning in the lock about an hour later. It was too early. Teresa burst into the living room without taking off her shoes. Looking at her, Aurelio immediately understood something terrible had happened. Disheveled hair, unnatural paleness, trembling lips turning blue, and, most frightening of all, panic in her eyes. Anselma didn't come back? His wife blurted out, looking at her husband hopefully. He shook his head negatively. At that moment, horror gripped his heart like an icy hand. She was with you. What happened? The man mumbled in confusion. Instead of an answer, Teresa rushed to the phone and dialed the police number. Only later, much later, did Aurelio learn the details of what had happened. First, there were frantic searches in the park for their daughter, conversations with the police, and attempts to calm down Teresa, who nevertheless fell into hysterics. However, before that, she did answer all the police's questions in detail and thoroughly. The search for the little girl who disappeared in the park began immediately. Police squads combed through the area, and volunteers joined them. The disaster that befell the two unfortunate parents left no one indifferent. It was not easy for the police to persuade Teresa and Aurelio to stay in the apartment. Only one argument worked, the girl might come home on her own. Someone had to be home at that moment. You won't help the search anyway, the young man in the uniform persuaded the distressed parents. Extra emotions, escalating the situation. People need to work calmly, without distractions. Well, you understand. Aurelio sat on the couch, tightly embracing his wife. 
Teresa shivered heavily, constantly blaming herself and choosing the harshest expressions. Admittedly, Aurelio initially felt the desire to blame Teresa for everything. She didn't take care, wasn't attentive enough, and lost sight of the child. But seeing his wife's condition, the man held back. Why torment a person who has already been beside herself with grief? This could happen to anyone. It was just a coincidence. There was no guilt on Teresa's part. We had such a nice walk through the alleys, the woman shared her memories, sobbing. Anselmo was delighted with everything happening in the park, entertainers, photographers with little monkeys, music, the smell of cotton candy and popcorn, and children's workshops. There were so many people in the park that day. Well, it was the City Day celebration. Festive events always attracted people from all over the city to this place. The celebration took place at the summer stage in the center of the park. It was there that a festive concert took place with the participation of the best children's groups in the region. Little artists sang, danced, played musical instruments, and performed scenes from famous artworks. In the intervals between the performances, the hosts conducted contests among young spectators and generously rewarded the winners with prizes. Anselmo was heading there. I didn't want to go there with her, Teresa recounted. The crowd was too big. She's too small. Well, why should we push through there? But Anselma really wanted to see the concert. She begged me, asked, and even tried to bribe me. In general, as always, she went straight to her goal. Aurelio nodded. He understood perfectly how it all happened. Anselma dreamed of performing on stage someday. Their girl was a born performer. Of course, hardly anything could stop her. That's how Teresa and Anselma found themselves in the crowd. The mother thought her daughter would see that it was impossible to get to the stage. Maybe she would be scared of such a crowd, and then it would be easier to distract her and take her somewhere less crowded. But no. The little girl stubbornly pushed her way through the crowd and closer to the stage. And then, a local rock band came on stage to perform. It was a young group, but the musicians had already made a name for themselves on national TV. Teresa didn't know that the highlight of the concert would be celebrities, otherwise, she would never have dragged her daughter into the crowd. She knew what that meant. A crush began, the woman sobbed. People seemed to go crazy. It felt like everyone in the park rushed closer to the stage. I was so scared. I wanted to pick on Selma up, but I didn't make it. We were separated, and she got lost in the crowd. Teresa screamed, calling for her daughter, but the music was so loud that the unfortunate woman couldn't even hear herself. The fans around them were singing at the top of their lungs. The concert ended, and the crowd quickly thinned out. Teresa ran around the stage, asking everyone she met if they had seen a girl in a red coat. A little one with two pigtails. People shook their heads negatively and hurried about their business. The woman ran along the paths and alleys and inspected the playgrounds, searching with her eyes for a small, L bright red spot. After all, Anselma was so prominently dressed, she should stand out from the crowd. But the girl was nowhere to be found. Finally, the unfortunate woman came across an old security guard. The elderly man listened to her and made the suggestion that Teresa was like a drowning man who clutched at straw. Well, maybe your girl is home by now? Lost sight of you, well, and ran home. She knows the way, doesn't she? She does, Teresa nodded and rushed home at full speed. There was hope, even near certainty, Anselma must have been home. She's already come home, where else could she be? But in the apartment, the woman met only a bewildered Aurelio. In the beginning, the searches were active. Posters with pictures of the missing girl appeared on the city's columns and walls. Teresa herself chose the photo for these announcements, the one taken on Anselma's birthday. By the end of the second day, volunteers and police began to talk about the slim chances of finding the child alive. Typically, a favorable outcome is possible within the first few hours after a disappearance. But Aurelio and Teresa didn't want to believe that. They searched the internet for stories of children who returned home weeks and months after being missing, alive and unharmed. 
It happens, and these are not isolated cases. The spouses couldn't eat, sleep, or drink at first. They didn't know where their little girl was or what was happening to her. How could one swallow even a bite of food in such a situation? Both became emaciated and lost weight. Teresa constantly blamed herself. Periodically, she would fall into hysterics. But the scariest moments were when the woman sat, slightly rocking, and stared into space with an absent gaze. Aurelio thought she was disconnecting from reality to reboot her nervous system, but it looked very frightening. During these difficult days, the man was afraid to leave his wife alone. Several weeks passed. Aurelio returned to work, tasks distracted him a bit and made him switch focus. Although the dreadful thoughts still lingered in his mind. Where was Anselma? What was happening to her? They loved their girl so much and took care of her. The child knew nothing but love, attention, and warmth. And those people who were now with her, how were they treating the girl? Anselma must have been very scared, and, of course, she must have been missing her mom, dad, and home. She was probably crying. These thoughts tore at Aurelio's heart. Teresa was also a source of concern. Her face was expressionless. Either her mother or Aurelio's mother was always with her. They were afraid she might do something to herself. They convinced Teresa that Anselma still needed her. What would the girl do without her mother when she returned? But Teresa was very difficult. Guilt weighed heavily on her. The impossibility of hugging her daughter plunged her into unbearable sorrow. Sometimes, the woman couldn't cope with emotions, tearing clothes, throwing dishes against the wall, and screaming like a wounded beast. Aurelio didn't stop or calm her down in those moments. Three months have passed since Anselma's disappearance. It was already winter, and the searches had subsided. No, they didn't stop entirely, but they weren't as active. The investigator said that the chances were now low, but they would still try. The spouses also learned the horrifying statistics. It turned out that many children disappear around the world every year, and they are never found, neither alive nor dead. Aurelio had never thought about it before. How much sorrow and misery there is on this planet. This is the world they brought their tender and talented girl into, and they failed to protect her. The main focus of the investigation was abduction. Because if the girl simply got lost in the city, she would have been found long ago. The same would have happened if something unfortunate had happened to Anselma, if she got hit by a car, fell into a manhole, or stumbled into some pit. But the girl disappeared without a trace, which meant someone took great care to cover their tracks. Closer to spring, one of the volunteers found Anselma's belongings in a landfill, her coat and beret. The investigator called the parents to identify the clothing. Teresa immediately and confidently said that it was her daughter's coat and beret. She couldn't be mistaken because it was Teresa who bought Anselma the beautiful outfit. What does this mean? Aurelio asked with hope in his voice. It's hard to say, shrugged the investigator. Perhaps it's a hopeful sign. The abductor didn't intend to harm the girl. They disposed of the clothing because it was too conspicuous and could attract attention. That's good, Teresa whispered. After the discovery of the belongings, the spouses somehow believed that Anselma would soon be found. So much time went by without any news, and then such a lead appeared. However, nothing of the sort happened. The case stalled again. Aurelio tried to get his wife back to work. He knew that her former colleagues would welcome her with open arms, even after such a long break. Engaging in her favorite work would help Teresa get back to life, feel needed, and be useful. Sitting within four walls was draining the life out of her. What are you talking about? Teresa got irritated. I'll go to work, and at that very moment, Anselma will come home, and no one will be here. Do you understand what you're suggesting? Teresa stayed at home all the time, leaving only when her husband was at home. She scoured the internet in search of happy stories of children returning. These boys and girls ended up in all kinds of situations. Some ran away and roamed the country for a while. Others were abducted and held captive. Teresa entertained various assumptions about her daughter's fate. Thirteen years passed. 
Teresa completely surrendered, turning into a pale, wrinkled old woman. She began to experience serious heart problems. Hospitalization was required, but she refused. Look at what you've done to yourself. Aurelio couldn't bear to see his wife in such a state. She still couldn't reconcile herself with the loss. Of course, Aurelio suffered and grieved too. He understood that the longing for the lost daughter would be with him forever. But unlike his wife, he accepted the situation, returned to life, and resumed work. Teresa, on the other hand, persistently pushed herself to nervous exhaustion and illness. She continued to blame herself. At night, she sometimes woke up screaming. She often had terrible nightmares. Teresa adamantly refused to go to the hospital. The ambulance often came to them now. She had heart attacks. Doctors gave her injections and strongly recommended hospitalization. But Teresa kept writing refusal after refusal. Aurelio couldn't convince her of the necessity of treatment. She didn't perceive any of his arguments. Sometimes he felt that it would be better if they found Anselmo lifeless. Then Teresa would finally accept the terrible truth and there would be some certainty. But for now, the case had almost come to a standstill. However, over the years, the couple has been called to the police station several times to identify children resembling Anselma. The search for the missing girl had spread across the country, and calls came in from various corners, reporting sightings of a similar child near a store, on a playground, or by a pond. Aurelio and Teresa scrutinized photographs and surveillance footage. Sometimes they were even shown orphan girls found somewhere at a train station, but there was never on Selma. Take a closer look, the investigator urged. It's been a long time. The girl may have changed and grown up. But both spouses shook their heads negatively. They would recognize their daughter even if she had grown older. The investigator's calls worsened Teresa's condition every time. First, she felt desperate hope, then another bitter disappointment. It all brought back the emotions from many years ago, causing her to fall into hysteria again. It took a great deal of effort for Aurelio to calm his wife. Friends advised Aurelio to leave Teresa. She's not living, and she's preventing you from returning to normal life, they said. You've already accepted that Anselmo won't come back. You have a chance to marry someone again, maybe become a father. But Aurelio couldn't even think about such a thing. He still loved Teresa. His wife was a close and dear person to him. They had been through so much together, and those sufferings had brought them closer and united. Aurelio no longer hoped to find Anselma, but he still believed that Teresa would recover, overcome her terrible grief, and almost return to her former self. And maybe, just like before, they would go on trips. A change of scenery would benefit both of them. However, nothing worked out. Another heart attack took the life of the not-so-old woman right in her husband's arms. The ambulance didn't make it in time this time. As the doctors later said, it was all heading in that direction. Teresa had brought this upon herself, unable to cope with the disaster that befell her. So Aurelio was left alone. He had been grieving for his wife. He was very sorry for her wasted life. He reviewed in his memory their lives from the moment their daughter disappeared, trying to understand if there was anything else he could have done for his wife to pull her out of this state. Everything seemed to indicate that there wasn't. Aurelio had done everything within his power. Yet, the seed of doubt prevented him from finding peace. Several years later, Simona entered Aurelio's life. At that time, he was closer to 60. He hadn't even thought that such changes were possible in his life. She was one of his colleagues, a divorced woman who had raised two sons on her own. The boys had gone far away, one studying abroad and the other living in a distant seaside city. Simona, accustomed to taking care of someone, suffered from loneliness and felt unneeded. Somehow, Aurelio and Simona gradually became close. It was easy and peaceful for him to be around this warm and caring woman. It turned out to be wonderful when someone thought about him and tried to do something nice. Aurelio liked feeling like a protector and defender again. Soon, they were living together in Aurelio's apartment. 
He had long renovated all the rooms to erase any reminders of family life because it was too painful to see curtains chosen by Teresa, look at children's furniture specifically purchased for Anselma, and understand that his daughter and beloved wife were not there and would never be there again. Simona, of course, knew the life story of her chosen one. She supported him and attentively listened to Aurelio's outpourings, which lightened his burden. She hugged him, stroked his head, and refrained from asking unnecessary questions. In turn, Aurelio was interested in Simona's stories about her life, which had not been easy, but in a different way. Her husband turned out to be an alcoholic and also had a violent streak. It was difficult for her to get rid of him. Besides, raising two sons on her own was not a walk in the park. But all these were normal life difficulties that didn't break Simona, they only strengthened her. Fate had prepared a much more terrible trial for Aurelio. Somehow, the man managed to survive his grief. Of course, thoughts about Anselma still haunted him. He often wondered if his daughter was still alive and, if so, how she was living. Anselma was now a young woman, just over 20. She was a real beauty, probably. Memories of Anselma could trigger anything. Now, this curious little girl, pestering her parents with questions, had become such a trigger. The family was strolling, not far from Aurelio. He looked at the cute child one last time and turned in the other direction. He wanted to walk past the fountain. A small crowd had gathered in the square. At first, Aurelio didn't understand what had caused such interest among passers-by, but then he suddenly heard a voice, pure, ringing, and high. Someone was singing by the fountain, hidden from Aurelio's view by the backs of people. An invisible child was playing the familiar melody from the cartoon about unicorns, Anselma's favorite cartoon. The young singer's voice strongly resembled Aurelio's daughter's voice, tears welled up in his eyes. The longing for Anselma squeezed the man's heart with renewed force. But that was okay, he had gotten used to it. Now Aurelio, of course, couldn't just walk past. He pushed through the crowd and stood still, struck by the sight. On the edge of the fountain, there was a girl about Anselma's age when she disappeared, and there was something indescribably reminiscent of Aurelio's daughter about her, although she was clearly a little gypsy. She had dark skin, long, dark, loose hair, black eyebrows wide apart, and huge brown eyes. The little girl was dressed in a colorful blouse with long sleeves and a floor-length skirt adorned with lush frills. She had a massive necklace on her neck, completely unsuitable for such a tiny girl, adorning her neck. The little gypsy was diligently playing the familiar melody, dancing in rhythm. The audience was smiling and generously showering coins and bills into the box at the young performer's feet. The girl, seeing how well people treated her, tried even harder. She suddenly raised her arms, performing another dance move, and on her delicate wrists, bracelets sparkled. And then Aurelio was stunned. He recognized one of the bracelets. How could he not recognize this unique item? It was exclusively made for his daughter, with pink unicorns. Certainly, to be completely sure, he needed to examine the jewelry up close, but Aurelio already understood everything perfectly. The little girl finished the song, the adults applauded her, and they began to disperse. Aurelio was still standing by the lamppost. He didn't know what to do. Should he have approached the child and asked her where she got this bracelet? He didn't want to frighten the little gypsy. It would be better to wait until one of the adults came for her. They were probably nearby. Indeed, after a couple of minutes, a teenager about 12 or 13 approached her, swarthy, curly-haired, and black-eyed. He smiled at the singer, asked something, and she answered. The boy ruffled her hair, took her by the hand, then picked up the box of money with his other hand and led the little gypsy away from the square. Aurelio, feeling anxious, followed the children. Indeed, what could he do? Approach the boy? There was no doubt, the boy could easily pick up the little girl and dash away, light and swift. Clearly, he was a cautious lad, and any undue attention might spook him. So, Aurelio continued to walk behind the children. Meanwhile, the little gypsies passed the main square, strolled through the labyrinth of narrow central streets, and found themselves on the outskirts of the city. 
There were old private houses, mostly inhabited by elderly people. Beyond this street, there was an open field, and behind it, a bypass road. From a distance, Aurelio noticed that a camp had settled on this field, vans, people sitting in groups around campfires, lively chatter. So that's where the children were headed. Aurelio probably should have gone after them and talked to the adults. But how would he be treated? It was frightening to go, but what else could he do? For the first time in so many years, there was some news about Anselma. What if this thread led Aurelio to his daughter? What if he finally learned what happened to his princess? With determined steps, the man followed the children. The boy noticed the pursuit, turned around disapprovingly, and looked at Aurelio with a suspicious gaze. But his adults were nearby, so the teenager felt at ease, he was on his territory. The boy just quickened his pace, and the little girl barely kept up with him, her tiny feet shuffling through the grass in well-worn sneakers. And then, from around the corner of the last house on the street, a young gypsy woman appeared. It was immediately evident that she was the mother of the little singer. The girl pulled her hand out of the boy's palm, rushed towards the woman, and embraced her. The beautiful gypsy covered the girl's face with kisses, murmured something affectionate in her ear, and the young singer laughed happily. Aurelio was standing there, unable to move. This young gypsy, her hair, eyes, brows, and lips were remarkably similar to Aurelio's own grandmother. The one on Selma resembled so much. The man felt as if he had been doused with ice-cold water. No, this just couldn't be. The sun-blackened face, the white-toothed smile, the massive golden earrings in her ears, and the beauty mark. The beauty mark on her cheek, which, it turns out, Aurelio remembered so well. This beauty mark had a shape resembling a small heart. Anselma used to be delighted that she had the same mark on her cheek as the unicorn from the cartoon. The woman noticed the stranger's intense gaze, the smile slowly faded from her face. She hugged the child tighter and was about to leave, but Aurelio called out to her. Anselma? Anselma? The gypsy woman stopped. For a while, she scrutinized the not-so-young man standing before her, then decisively walked towards him, still holding her daughter close. Excuse me, Aurelio began. Don't be afraid, please. I won't harm you, I just need you to read my fortune. The last sentence surprised Aurelio himself. It was the first thing that came to his mind. She was the tan girl from the camp, and everyone knew that gypsy women earned their living by fortune-telling. To read your fortune? The girl smirked. The little girl in her arms also smiled. Well, okay, I'll read your fortune if you really want me to. Georgia, run to the camp and wait for me there. The girl nodded obediently and hurried to where the gypsies had stopped, following the boy, who had almost reached the field. Her name is Georgia? Aurelio smiled, studying the gypsy woman's face. He became increasingly convinced that it was Anselma, his changed, grown-up daughter. Aurelia realized that he might be seeing what he wished for rather than reality, but there were just too many coincidences. The song from his daughter's favorite IT cartoon, performed by little Georgia, the bracelet on the girl's wrist, and now, the young gypsy woman. Yes, my daughter is named Georgia, the girl finally replied. What do you want me to tell your fortune about? Many years ago, a long time ago, my daughter was abducted. She went for a walk with her mother. They got caught in a crowd, and a crush began. Well, then they never found the little girl. I would like to know what happened to her. I will pay. I'll pay whatever you ask. Abducted your daughter? The gypsy woman's voice trembled. That's terrible, very terrible. I... I won't dare to foretell such things. I have a daughter myself, and I wouldn't want to invoke any misfortune. Can I ask a question then? Where did your girl get that bracelet? My daughter had the exact same one. Aurelio knew that the gypsy woman might turn around and leave, so he asked the crucial question. I also have a question. Why did you call me Anselma? That was my daughter's name, and it seemed to me that... That it's me? Yes, Aurelio admitted, taken aback by the turn of their conversation. 
My name is Fortunata. That's what the gypsies call me. And on the back of that bracelet, which I never parted with all this time, the name Anselma is written. I approached you because you called me by that name. It's strange and interesting. I can't believe this. It seems you really are my daughter. Tell me about yourself, please. Who are your parents? How long have you been in the camp? Were you born there? Fortunata shook her head. No, I am a foundling. My father said he found me, ragged and hungry, at the station. I don't remember that. I was little. And this bracelet has always been with me since I became aware of myself. They said my grandmother, Rosalinda, gave it to me. Now I understand. The bracelet is from that other life. I always suspected that. I ordered it on my daughter's fourth birthday. Aurelio shook his head. It's one of a kind in the whole world. There can't be any mistake. It belonged to Anselma. I think that's you. Tell me about yourself. I'll tell you, Fortunata sighed. From the very beginning, when we ended up in this city, I immediately felt like I had been here before. A lot of familiar things, urban landscapes, even the smells, some sensations. And now, this meeting of ours. I also want to figure everything out. Little Fortunata always knew that her father, Kuro, had picked her up at the station. Your own kin abandoned you. White people often do that, get rid of unwanted children. We, the gypsies, have a completely different attitude towards children. There were four sons in the Kuro family, and they were missing only a daughter. So, Kuro took the little girl in. Cornelia, Kuro's wife, Rosalinda, the grandmother, the brothers, and Kuro all treated the little girl with tenderness and care. They loved the charming girl and embraced her. And when it turned out that the girl had a beautiful voice and danced well, the popularity and value of the foundling increased even more. A talented child like her could bring the family a lot of money. Fortunata liked it when one of her brothers played the guitar, and she danced and sang by the fire in the eyes of the admiring camp members. People watched her, applauded, and showed their approval. It was wonderful. The girl lived with her family in a van, like the other members of their community. The camp traveled around the country, stopping in one city and then another. Landscapes, people, and houses changed. Fortunata visited both large metropolises and large urban-type settlements. She met new people and performed in squares and parks. That's how gypsies earned a living. They stopped near one settlement or another, and it began. Children danced and sang. Women told fortunes to everyone interested. Men, they had their own grand, secret affairs. Fortunata understood what was going on only as she grew older. These were thefts. That's why gypsies didn't stay in one place for long. They feared persecution, revenge, or the police. Fortunata, in principle, liked such a life. She loved her strict father, Kuro, her talkative and affectionate mother, Cornelia, and her brothers, so different, so caring. Fortunata had especially close relationships with her grandmother Rosalinda, Kuro's mother. The elderly woman never doubted the soul of her granddaughter. She told her fairy tales, gave her jewelry, and P performed rituals on her to make Fortunata happy and healthy. The grandmother often told her granddaughter how lucky she was. After all, Kuro found her at the station, lonely, abandoned, and unwanted by anyone. Who knew what could have happened to such a little thing if she hadn't ended up in good hands? They often, very often, told me bad things about my blood parents. Fortunata stared intently into Aurelio's face, trying to discern familiar features. They said white people treat children irresponsibly, but on the streets of cities, I saw different things. Yes, there were street children there, but I also noticed many prosperous families where children were happy. So, I concluded that my parents were not good. Because good parents wouldn't leave a child at the station, the young woman looked challengingly at Aurelio. He understood what was happening. If he really considered himself the father of this girl, then at some point he let that happen. The little girl was left alone at the station, hunger, ragged, dirty. How did I end up at the station? The gypsy woman asked, looking directly into the man's eyes. 
Did you not keep an eye on your daughter? Or maybe you decided to get rid of her like that. What are you talking about? Aurelio objected. Our little girl was the most precious thing to us. The man suddenly began to recount the happy four years when their wonderful daughter lived in their family with Teresa. He first told the long story of how they struggled to have a child. Then he spoke about the early childhood of their daughter. It was pleasant to reminisce about those bright, warm moments. It turned out he almost forgot nothing, the joy of Anselma's first steps, their joint travels and walks, and the wonderful holidays Teresa organized for their daughter. Our little girl loved unicorns a lot and sang well, just like your daughter, Georgia. By the way, speaking about the song she sang by the fountain, that's the favorite song of our Anselma. She also used to perform it in a very similar manner. Fortunata didn't answer immediately. It seemed like she was trying to remember something. I taught her that, the girl said. Some things from my past life stayed with me, not just the bracelet. I remembered that song, and, strangely enough, I could read it at four years old. This skill is still with me. They don't teach girls among us, only boys, and even then, it's superficial. But I can read. Sometimes, I dreamed of people who loved me very much, but I don't remember their faces. But I remember the hands, warm and caring. I thought I was making it up myself, my imagination has always been good. And also, now, when you were talking, I remembered something. Yes, I really rode a unicorn, a real one. I dreamed of this scene several times, and the unicorn was just like the one you described. So, are we really father and daughter? It definitely can be said only after DNA analysis, Aurelio said with a trembling voice. But it seems to me that it's true. Fortunata pressed her fingers to her temples and wrinkled her nose, just like her mother when she was worried. And what do we do now? The girl looked at the man, seeking support. I think we need to check everything to make sure for both of us. Well, also to restore your documents. I already have no doubt that you are on Selma. There are too many coincidences. I think you should go back home. Or... Here, Aurelio's heart tightened with a sense of impending trouble. Or do you want to live in the camp? You said you were happy with the gypsies. That was in childhood, Fortunata shook her head. When I grew up, everything changed. There's a special attitude towards children in the camp, but adults' lives are not easy at all. For many household duties, you have to unquestioningly obey men. For disobedience, a husband can even beat his wife, and he won't be punished for it. I can't do what I want, read, walk, or learn. And I'm forced to deceive people for money, that's the most unpleasant thing. But if I don't collect the required amount in the evening, I'll be punished, and I've been punished more than once. Then Fortunata told about how Kuro married her off. She was about 16 at the time. The family chose a good groom for their only daughter, the son of a prosperous gypsy. David was as young as the bride. He passionately loved another, and the whole camp knew about it. But that girl was not his equal, so there was no possibility for them to get married. Fortunata cried before the wedding. She didn't want to get married, although David was young, handsome, and wealthy, besides. But the girl still felt like a child, and she knew about the groom's feelings for another. The whole camp knew about it. But still, they got married. Parents on both sides demanded heirs, and that's how Georgia appeared in the family. Fortunata never thought she could love anyone like that. The daughter became the meaning of her life, the light. David was indifferent to both his wife and daughter. He ran to that other woman again. Again, everyone in the camp knew about it, but such behavior was allowed for a man. Fortunata didn't object or feel jealous, now her daughter was everything for her. She sang her songs, designed beautiful dresses for her little one, and braided her hair. Georgia inherited her mother's talent, she could sing and dance well too. Naturally, the camp decided to use to the fullest the child's gift. As the girl grew up, they turned her into a street singer. Just like her mother once did, the girl performed in various city squares and did so with pleasure. The audience applauded the little one, generously paying for the performance. Georgia happily smiled. 
However, Fortunato was very worried about her daughter. She realized that the same future awaited the little one as hers. She wouldn't study and wouldn't get a good job, but she would continue to please people with her voice. And when she grew up and lost her childlike charm and spontaneity, they would make her a fortune teller. Fortunata dreamed of a different future for herself and her daughter. It seemed to her that both of them should live differently, but it seemed impossible. I think they abducted you back then in the crowd, Aurelio said, looking at his daughter. Yes, now he was completely convinced, before him was Anselma. And he deeply regretted the lost years his daughter had to spend like this, in the camp among strangers, obeying foreign traditions and strict rules. But now, everything would change. It's possible, Fortunata nodded. I haven't experienced this myself, but Grandma Rosalinda used to say that childless gypsy couples used to take children from the streets of cities. They chose little ones who were unlikely to remember the past. Raised them as their own children. And Grandma was happy to say that gypsies tried to abduct dark-skinned children to avoid raising suspicions later. A fair-skinned child among dark gypsy kids would be suspicious. And you, a girl with a tan, into my grandma. Aurelio smiled. I'll show you the photos later. Incredible resemblance. Probably, this fact also worked against us. Gypsies chose you because you were remotely similar to them. I still can't believe it, Fortunata looked completely lost. She looked at the camp, visible from here, then at Aurelio. So, you will leave? Right now. You'll go and get the child, tell them you found your family, and won't stay there anymore? I'll go with you, of course, whatever happens. It's not that simple, they won't let me go. How is that? I'll call the police, they'll be arrested for kidnapping. No, we need to do it differently. You don't know these people, everything has to be done secretly. And then we'll have to leave here. Because, for sure, they'll look for me, and sooner or later, they'll find out. Betrayal is severely punished, and you'll be in danger too. Think carefully. Do you need all of this? Do you want to ruin your peaceful life? Don't rush, it's an important decision. Well, what are you even talking about? Of course, I'm ready. Aurelio responded immediately. Good. So, here's the plan. Tomorrow, I'll go with Georgia to the square. I always accompany her. We're being watched throughout the day. They check on us in the morning, around noon, and closer to the evening. Come for us at 11. Usually, there's no surveillance at that time. We'll need to hide. Lay low for some time. Maybe a week, maybe a month. They'll be looking for me. You can hide in my apartment. No one will think to look for you there. Do you live alone? Fortunata asked. Will anyone be against us? No. Aurelio declared firmly. Only now did he think about Simona, as she would be drawn into this story too. And she had no choice. But he was sure Simona would understand him, as always. She knew Anselma's story and was concerned for her beloved. She would be happy for him, and he could trust her. No, Aurelio shook his head negatively. I'm not alone. Is that my mom, your wife? Again, Aurelio shook his head negatively, and his heart pinched painfully. Teresa didn't wait for her daughter. She left without knowing what had happened to Anselma. It was so unfair and so sad. Tomorrow at 11, I'll come for you. Okay, I need to go now. Fortunata turned abruptly and hurried back to the camp. It seemed they were already waiting for her there. The rest of the day and night, Aurelio was in a strange state. At times, joy overwhelmed him, and suddenly doubts would take over. What if Fortunata wasn't Anselma after all? Standing next to the girl, he had no doubt she was his daughter. But now, when she was far away, he began to feel like he had invented this meeting himself and adjusted the facts to fit his story. Simona, who listened carefully to Aurelio, was also very upset. She even cried. Unlike her beloved, she was sure that everything would be fine now. This is Anselma, definitely Anselma. Well, 
Such coincidences just don't happen. I can't wait to meet her and her daughter. Wow. This is even more exciting than in the movies. Aurelio didn't sleep that night. He kept tossing and turning, thinking about the possibility that Anselma and Georgia might not show up at the square tomorrow. Something could go wrong. Anselma Fortunata herself might reconsider and choose to stay in the camp. Or maybe she just deceived him. Why? Well, who knew the truth? Maybe she just enjoyed fooling others. Simona took a day off from work on that day, and Aurelio also called his boss, taking an unpaid leave. At the fountain, the man arrived even earlier than the agreed-upon time. Little Georgia, just like yesterday, delighted the audience with her pure, ringing voice. Fortunata wasn't in sight at first, but then. Aurelio noticed her. She was sitting at a distance, attentively watching her daughter. They exchanged glances, and the girl gestured not to rush. Aurelio nodded understandingly. He was watching his daughter and granddaughter, and, of course, he didn't miss the crucial moment. Fortunata rose from the bench, walked quickly to Georgia, picked up the little girl, and then hurried to Aurelio. And then, then, all together, they were meandering through narrow streets until they reached the parking lot where the man had left his car. Fortunata kept looking around, as if trying to remember the past. I did some repairs in the apartment. Now everything here is completely different, not like in the time when you lived here, Aurelio said. But the view from the window seems familiar to me, the girl said thoughtfully. Just something is missing. It seems there used to be a tall tree here. Its branches scratched the glass, and I liked that a lot. They cut it down, Aurelio replied, looking at his daughter with surprise. How could she, such a little thing, remember these details? The tree blocked the light for people, so they got rid of it. Too bad. Aurelio walked along the seashore, tightly holding the little hand of his granddaughter, Georgia. The story that happened to his family couldn't help but leave its mark on the man's behavior. He didn't take his eyes off the child. The grandfather and the little girl walked along the very edge of the water. Their bare feet left clear prints on the wet sand. Georgia was asking him a lot of questions, just like her mom used to do. She was a very smart and quick-witted girl, thinking on her feet. Soon she would go to school, and Aurelio was sure that his granddaughter would become one of the best in the class. After all, she could already read, count, and write. Georgia learned easily and with pleasure. Currently, Aurelio was escorting his granddaughter to the music school. At the family meeting, it was decided that such talent shouldn't have been wasted, so Anselma enrolled her daughter in the music school. At first, the teachers didn't want to take the girl, she was still so young. They advised waiting for a year until she started school. But after the audition, these people changed their minds. September was sunny this year, and school activities had already begun. Georgia was now going to her fourth lesson, accompanied by her grandfather. So far, the little girl was thrilled with the music school. Aurelio hoped it would continue like this. And if not, well, then they would look for something else for Georgia. The man still couldn't believe that his life had taken such a turn. Then, a year ago, Fortunata and Georgia hid in the apartment for about a month. The camp had long been dismantled and gone, but gypsies still roamed the city, searching, watching, and keeping an eye out. They questioned people, and once a young man approached Aurelio with a question, had he seen gypsy girls with a little child? He added that she was mentally ill and very dangerous. During it, Aurelio got to know his daughter again, familiarizing himself with her. Simona and he carefully planned the return of Anselma. They needed to confirm the kinship with a DNA test, file a statement with the police, and restore a whole pile of documents. And most importantly, they had to teach Anselma how to live in this new world. Surprisingly, the latter came easily. However, there were some problems with the documents, but eventually they were resolved. Anselma insisted on moving. She couldn't feel at ease in this city. They will come back, look for me to punish me for betrayal, the girl said. For the happiness and peace of her daughter, Aurelio was willing to do anything. 
Simona supported him and suggested moving to a small seaside town where her younger son had been living for many years. And now, they were here in a quiet, cozy place by the sea. Simona got a job at the local library. She enjoyed taking care of her grandchildren, her son's daughters, and Georgia. The girls became friends, having a lot of fun together. Anselma gradually adjusted to the new world. Once, she had great hopes. Teresa dreamed of a scientific career for her daughter, but the years were irretrievably lost. The girl didn't receive an education, so she was now attending hairdressing courses, a demanding and creative profession. Besides, in the camp, Anselma loved doing hairstyles. Gypsy women trusted their hair to her. In the evenings, the girl sang in a restaurant, and the audience applauded her. Anselma liked the stage herself, and the money was never superfluous. Aurelio was now at peace with his daughter. She wouldn't disappear. Smart, determined, and hardworking, she quickly made many friends in the new place. She still tried not to talk about her past. She was afraid that rumors would spread and the gypsies would find her. Some of her daughter's fears still had to be overcome, but with Aurelio and Simona by her side, they would manage. Georgia almost didn't talk about life in the camp. New vibrant impressions currently overshadowed her memories. Over time, much would be erased from the child's memory, but, of course, there was still work to be done. Well, that's it. Let's put on our shoes, commanded Aurelio. In his hand, he carried his flip-flops and sandals along with his granddaughters. Maybe we'll take a dip? The girl suggested. The water is so warm. We'll be quick. You'll be late for the class, smiled the happy grandfather. Let's do it later, after class. Okay, Georgia agreed easily. And then, let's go to the city pond and feed the ducks with bread, all right? Aurelio looked at his granddaughter but saw a little Anselma in front of him. She also often asked him to go to the pond with her so that the poor ducks wouldn't go hungry. Aurelio was quite happy now. His daughter, granddaughter, beloved woman, all was well in his life. Only thoughts of Teresa never left him in peace. The man desperately regretted that his wife never found out about the fate of their lost daughter. But, well, there was nothing he could do about it. Grandpa, what are you thinking about? Georgia tugged at Aurelio's hand and demanded an answer. You look sad. Not sad, thoughtful. Trying to decide whether we should go to a pizzeria or an ice cream cafe after your class. I don't know. The girl exclaimed. Then she mischievously smiled and asked. Grandpa, do I have a thoughtful face like yours right now? Aurelio looked at this bright, happy child and smiled. All the sad and melancholy thoughts immediately left his head next to this noisy troublemaker. If you're enjoying it as well, Leave a like and subscribe to the channel.